So once again, this is the El Fego Baca presentation by Dr. Joe Sweeney. There you go, doctor, oh. go ahead. Hello, and, and thanks for joining me this afternoon uh, for a presentation on an amazing, amazing, brave, courageous man, and later life considered controversial, but we'll talk about all that. As most things are, it depends on who's looking at what and who's saying what. So let's start if we may. Uh, I've done it PowerPoints to, so we could walk through steps on the presentation. And um, if you have questions, uh, we'll have some questions at the end of the presentation so we don't keep you here all day. <clears throat> so let's begin. Ofego Baca, there's a monument in Reserve, New Mexico today, which I hope you're looking at on your screen and you'll be able to see it. And um, to the right and left of him is a frame of an old, what they call hakal. A hakal is a structure that's uh, thin at Toby walls, <clears throat> built around straight, straight pikes, they have pikes for the housing. And if I cough every now and then, I'm kind of try, so please forgive me. And this is my very first presentation over Zoom. Everything in was always been face to face. So here we go. Of the legendary gunfighters in the 1800s in the West, Southwest, during the waning years of the gunfighters of the Old West, and um, instructor, you're blocking part of my presentation. Maybe I can move this <laughs> down. Yeah, like that. Okay. <clears throat> have been many movies, books, and other minutia that has made these legendary figures well known to many. Let's mention a few. Clay Allison, Confederate soldier, gunslinger, gunfighter, pretty, pretty ferocious man. He was killed by a wagon train that accidentally rolled over on his head when he went to check the wheel. Billy the Kid, most everybody in New Mexico knows about Billy the Kid, all over the United States too, I would suggest. Um, from 1859 to 1881, Matt Garrett, the man that shot and killed Billy the Kid, Wyatt Earp, his famous gunfight for the Old Creek at the OK Corral. Uh, Jesse James, to name another, 1847 to 1840. 1882 and others. So at the top, you'll see some slides that I'm referring to, and I try to keep it organized and follow with me and questions at the end, just ask. And then our hero, who's not only known to most these days, you know, uh, as I was doing my research to do this presentation, I would ask so many different people in so many different walks, hey, do you know who El Fago Baca is? No. Uh, so much so that a wonderful Public library here in Las Cruces doesn't have anything on them and couldn't find anything in the machine. I also went to Barnes and Noble. They too had nothing on them. And when they researched where they could get inventory from, there was nothing there. And um, towards the end of the presentation on the epilogue, perhaps we'll discuss maybe some reasons why. So let's talk about Ofego. He was born in Socorro in 1865. As you know, that's when the Civil War came to a close. He lived to be 80 years old and died peacefully in Albuquerque, New Mexico in 1945, the year World War II ended. Here's a picture of our young man, very unassuming, 19-year-old uh, when uh, he, this event occurred up in um, Frisco, New Mexico, which we'll address. But does he look like a ferocious, serious gunfighter to you? Many would say, no, it's kind of like unassuming. Well, let's see further what the life of El Fago is about. This young man at 19 years old courageously fought off 8-0, follow me, 80 cowboys from surrounding cattle ranches, mainly the J. Slaughter Ranch. It was a 33 to 36 hour gunfight between El Fago and the cowboys. It remains the most remarkable of a one man versus 60 to 80 men gun battle. Accounts of what happened in Frisco, and by the way, Frisco is current day reserve. Frisco was partitioned in three parts, upper, middle, and lower, all within a mile and a half. In reserve, this fight of one man against many was caused by the cowboys reportedly doing these things. One, lassoing a young Mexican woman, kidnapping her, never to be seen again. Next, drunken cowboys shooting up the town at chickens, dogs, buildings, and toward Mexican people shouting, remember the Alamo. Another event that occurred in Frisco involved a Mexican named Burro, 
because he was developmentally delayed, putting him on the bar in Milligan Saloon and castrating the man. Please note from here to four in this presentation, I shall use the word Mexican as they did then the Cowboys for all people of Latin American heritage, regardless of the 21 countries they came from. So in Frisco, in, in, at uh, Frisco, part of Socorro County, which I may at this point actually went from its current location all the way to the Arizona line. It was a massive area. So in historical terms, we'll use the terms Mexican and American or Mexican and cowboy. The influx of cowboys in commercial enterprises like the cattle barons and cowboys call themselves Americans and refer to all Latin Americans as Mexicans. Of course, today that is not so in the USA. New Mexico, all citizens are appropriately citizens. If not so, they should be afraid, they should be glad that El Fago is not around. With this in mind, let's continue the story of El Fago Baca, sometimes referred to as having nine lives, like the song played at the beginning. Unlike a Mexican named Burro, an atrocity on Burro. A Mexican man named Epitacio Martinez objected to the cruelty of what the drunken cowboys did to a man called El Burro. Epitacio was subsequently lassoed, tied to a post some 30 steps away from the drunken cowboys and used for target practice. Amazingly, having been shot in four places, all bullets hitting no vital organs, thanks to whiskey from Milliken the Saloon store. He survived. Today in uh, Reserve, New Mexico, his uh, great grand nephew, actually owns a store gas station and loves to chat with people about this heroic ancestor of his. Now, the local lawman did nothing for fear of his own demise from the drunken cowboys for them, quote unquote, just having some fun. Based on sheer lower numbers of Mexicans and the many cowboys, the Mexican citizens of Frisco felt powerless. No one stood up to them. The local lawman, his name was Saracino, pleads for help traveling to Socorro to plead his case. The Frisco sheriff relied the story to El Fago, while El Fago was a clerk in his uncle's store in Socorro, making 20 bucks a week. After admonishing the cowardliness of the Fresco lawman, El Fago agreed to go to Frisco as a deputy. His quote being, name is so, I will show the Texans there is at least one Mexican in the country who is not afraid of an American cowboy. El Fago arrived in Frisco to witness a drunken cowboy from the slaughter ranch, one of approximately 150 cowboys from that ranch, riding his horse and shooting up the town. El Fago disarmed and arrested the cowboy named Charlie McCarty, placing him in custody. That drew the ire from the cowboys that were in town at that time. So McCarty flees to the slaughter ranch, slaughter ranch and El Fago pursued. El Fago finally arrested McCarty and brought him back to Frisco. The American cowboys with a dozen or so gun-toting men again demanded the release of the cowboy. Baca refused and the cowboys insisted. Several of them drew their firearms. El Fago then shouted, I am counting to three and if you're not out of here, I will begin shooting. El Fago barely got to three and started shooting his Colt 45 pistols wounding one cowboy in the knee and killing ranch hand Parham's horse that rolled over killing Parham. The Frisco 33 to 36 hour siege of Baca started. Never before has a Mexican stand against the cowboys in Frisco, one against many shootout that began between El Fago and the cowboys. They were amazed that one man was gonna stand up to these injustices. But if you look at history, there are times that one man has made a huge difference. The cowboys from the slaughter ranch and others rode to all ranches within a day's ride shouting, the Mexicans started a revolution in Frisco and probably wiped out the slaughter ranch by then. Truth was, it was only El Fago that stood his ground as a lawful deputy. It was the following day that El Fago still has McCarty arrested. Upwards of 80 American cowboys converged on the town to deal with El Fago. After all, who the hell is this Mexican to arrest a cowboy just having a little fun? 
with upwards of 80 cowboys that one Ofego dead, how dare this Mexican, blah, blah, blah. I will not use the, the expletives. The cowboys waited for the trial to conclude with Charlie McCarty for shooting up to town, not even addressing the more serious issues at the time. This is what had life. So, um, Ofego, uh, when he arrested McCarty, he realized it's going to be a nothing thing. And what do you know? McCarty was found guilty, released after paying a $5 fine. Ofego, wisely suspecting the intentions of the American cowboys, ran like hell to a place that, to stand them off, stand off the cowboys. He wound up taking shelter at a hakal at the end of town. Now, on the beginning of our presentation, I showed you a monument in Reserve, New Mexico, made of, dedicated to, El Fago Baca and his bravery for things that change things, okay? So, the 80 cowboys pursued Baca, telling him to come out and surrender for killing Parham and Hearn, and he would receive a fair trial. Now, Hearn was the leader of another cowboy group, and, and we'll discuss that uh, shortly here. Baca responded by shooting his Colt 45 at the Cowboys. Here is a picture from the New Mexico Museum of History of a Hakal that Baca made his stand in for 33 to 36 hours. Now, if you look at this Hakal, of course it didn't look like that at, at those times, but a Hakal is simply made of straight posts, lined together, wired together, roped together, um, if you were lucky enough to have any nails nailed together. And the walls were simply filled with makeshift mud and straw, which we know is uh, stucco. So you can imagine bullets flying into that hakal, how um, things may or may not have happened to our hero. So the cowboys fired into the uh, hakal for hours, calling for Elgo Elfego to surrender. He responded with gunfire. During the gun battle, a lead cowboy named Hearn, as I just discussed previously, charged the Hakal, stating he get that Mexican, I'm gonna say blah, 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 because I can't use the exact language, cussing and threatening Baca. Well, Hearn kicked open the door and attempted to enter, and Baca shot him twice in the stomach, and he died within an hour on the same bar that they tortured Burro on. Given Baca's courage under fire, none of the cowboys were willing to charge the Hakal. The siege went on until dark, and they believed that Baca must be dead from the rain of bullets shot at the Hakal. However, no one would check. If you can imagine, the cowboys telling, hey, um, why don't you go check? And uh, he's got to be dead by now. Just go and see. And that one turned around and said, no, I think you should go and do this. And it was like, no, you go, no, you and finally they're like, well, it's dark, let's wait for morning. So next morning, breakfast time. As the cowboys laid siege, much to their chagrin, smoke arose from the hakal as the aroma of bacon permeated the air from within the hakal. El Fago was enjoying his breakfast, including good tortillas. As the siege continued, Baca wounded several of the cowboys. One cowboy used a cast iron cover of a stove as a shield as he crawled and approached towards the hakal. As the cowboy peeked over the top of his shield, Baca sent two rounds at his head. One grazed the cowboy's head, he dropped his shield and ran around like a chicken with his head chopped off, shouting, he killed me, he killed me. The graze was not serious as he bled and the cowboys all laughed heartily. Day two of the siege. The cowboys started to slowly merge on the hakal from all directions and Baca knew they were coming. His Colt 45s were blazing and they ran so fast the hounds couldn't catch him. We heard that in another song, huh? So they smartly devised what they thought was a good plan to have Baca surrender. They reportedly sent in a communication in Spanish for him to surrender. Baca started shooting at them after receiving the notice. Why? He was raised in English, reared in Topeka, Kansas for 15 years and not fluent in Spanish. But it was an assumption, oh, his name is Baca, he must be a Spanish speaker, huh? At the end of day two of the siege, the cowboys were unsuccessful in getting Baca to surrender. The exchange, the exchange of gunfire continued. Just wanna make sure I don't get ahead of myself here. So by the end of the siege, which was the third day, 
33 to 36 hours, there's varying accounts of the total number of hours historically, 4,000 rounds had been fired into the Hakal. The shack was dynamited as well, and Baca still stayed strong. The cowboys lighted logs and threw them on the roof, not knowing the dirt topped roof would not burn. Well, finally, a lawful sheriff came after being sought out by a Mexican of Frisco, and Baca surrendered with conditions. Those of you that just joined were using the term Mexican and American in historical perspective. He was to be tried in Socorro. He kept his Colt 45s. The buckboard wagon was to be driven by the sheriff and one other always in front of the wagon. Now, no cowboys were to ride behind the buckboard that the sheriff guaranteed Baca's safety with a double barrel in the head. He was serious. So, the killing of the two cowboys, which is what he's charged with, which was he was defending himself so he was not dead, um, involved these things as evidence. It's been documented that 4,000 rounds entered that Hakal during the siege, thereabout. 357 rounds were shot through the door alone. That, that was used as evidence in his trial in Socorro. The broom handle had eight bullet holes in it alone as evidence. And miraculously, a statue of La Senora de Santa Ana, and forgive me with the tilde of La Senora, somehow was miraculously unscathed during the volley of rounds that entered the Hakal. So, how could El Fago possibly not be shot dead during a siege? What do you think? And I'm gonna let that savor so you can ask a question or two or Give me your suggestion on how come he wasn't dead at the end of the presentation. So here we go. Furthermore, here's a picture of El Baco at 15 years old when he returned from Topeka, Kansas to Socorro, New Mexico, where his family were considered Hidalgos. Now, the Hidalgo in Socorro, the Hidalgo in the, in the um, area, et cetera, was not an official title, but a family of prominence, not given by the Spanish crown, but the Spanish crown really knew that Socorro existed in a new world. So why was this 19-year-old man so brave in light of it all? Well, let's study how Alfago Baca's history that perhaps made him the courageous gunfighter. Born in Socorro, raised in Kansas for nearly 15 years in English, he witnessed the Americans' mob rule in Socorro, New Mexico. That is, El Fago's mom died, and he was approximately 1880. His sister and brother all died as well within a few weeks of each other in Kansas. Well, at that time, it was determined that El Fago later returned at age 15 to his roots in Socorro. Having been educated in English, now in Socorro, the Baca family for two hundred years. I have the lineage in historical perspective have been uh, in that area, okay? Hidalgos. At age 15, his dad became sheriff in Berlin in Los Lunas. During the course of his duties, his dad killed a member of the Los Lunas family and did not have it. As was the case in most of the days in pre-territorial and territorial times in the good state of New Mexico and the Southwest West overall, Pressure by them resulted in El, Fago, El Fago's dad arrested, charged with murder. El Fago knew what the outcome would be and devised a plan at his young age. El Fago and a friend, we only know as Chavez historically, climbed into the courthouse upper window. The jail was on the lower floor. The floor was wooden between the two, where and where his dad was in prison. This was done while a fiesta was going on in town and no one was guarding the jail. The two sought a hole large enough to free his dad and two others from the jail. Dad and Ofego, after a period of time laying low, fled and went into hiding. And this left to Texas for seven years is where dad was. Ofego could not be charged with his escape for sawing a hole and getting him out because no one knew who did it. So, Let's talk about the influx of many of the quote unquote Americans or American cowboys into the Mexican so-called region at the time in the 1800s. Eventually the railroad stopped at Socorro. 
droves of Americans swarmed into Socorro. At that time, Socorro reached far and wide, starting at central New Mexico and ending far beyond current day reserve, which was then called Frisco for San Francisco um, because of a river that ran through. Now, that extended again all the way to the state line from current day Socorro to the state line of Arizona. So, Initially established in 1598 under Spain's rule, Socorro, so named in Spanish, as Socorro in English, Socor, is a place of aid on the Coronada del Muerto. If you have any questions about that, please ask after the end of the presentation. Events leading to Ofego's courage continued. You know, um, sometimes we act with events in history as they came out in the bubble. But more often than not, there's a cause and effect that does occur. So here we're talking about the cause is, and then you can get a better uh, picture as to why the effect came to this 19 year old and his bravery and at 15 actually to having the courage to start his dad out of jail. Now you say, oh, but that's escaping jail. Well, why was he there in the first place? What is justice? So here we go. The influx of the Americans to the region rapidly outnumbered the Mexicans by far. Many repeated the slogan, remember the Alamo. Now I'm gonna share as a historian before we go on. Goliad had nearly two and a half times the size of um, Texicans, they were called at the time, that were massacred. And we seem to not mention very much El Castillo, the academy that is adjacent to Chapultepec Park in current Mexico City, where very young cadets didn't surrender, and by the way, were killed, okay? So there's no one that's not guilty of things from time to time, and war can be so, so horrible. So to continue, now, the courts became powerless with these vigilante cowboys that became to be mob rule large groups, I'm talking 30, 40 cowboys that were vigilantes, okay? There became a mob rule over law by Americans as witnessed by El Fago at his very young age of 15 years old. Now, El Fago's brother and cousins got into a dispute with the newspaper owner editor and his brother shot and killed the editor by the name of Conklin, my grandmother's name. So what happened was with Conklin, he was, doing a newspaper that was pushing for English only and you know everything was pro-American, uh, not much to say good at all about Mexican, uh, remember the Alamo, made its way into the paper, if you get the picture, okay? So eventually what occurred is that his brother shot and killed the uh, editor by name Conklin in a dispute. He then fled to Esleta in Texas to avoid his prosecution. When finally caught and returned to Socorro, for trial, the cowboy vigilantes took him from custody and hanged him as 15-year-old El Fago, his brother, watched. That was mob justice, mob rule. The large cowboy ranchers migrated to Frisco. Why? El Fago has had his fill of mob rule in his teenage years from Socorro to Frisco. He wasn't about to be at the mercy of the cowboy mob knowing he would be killed by the mob without a trial by hanging for all to see. Make an example of them. The Baca family had been in the area for 200 years, as I mentioned, initially under Spanish rule and were known as Hidalgos, meaning a prominent family. So Corro from 1598 to 1821 was under Spain's rule, and then 1821 to 1846 politically under Mexico's rule and American law from 1846 to 1848 under the Treaty of Guadalupe, Guadalupe Hidalgo following the Mexican-American War, and finally a U.S. territory under U.S. rule. Now, the treaty de jure, in, uh, according to law, called for Mexicans to be U.S. citizens granting explicit rights, including language, property, and religion. However, de facto, in fact, those rights were abused in the Western, Southwestern USA as those cries of, remember the Alamo, led on. If that wasn't enough, 
The Spanish-American War was thrown in there for part of 1898. Again, a picture of El Fago, 19 years old, 1884. Does he look like a big gun-toting, strong, brutal kind of guy? Of course not. He was very unassuming, but we know a very, very brave and courageous man that made a difference. So his gunfight in Frisco in 1884 was assuredly second to none. As we continue the life and legend of El Fago Baca, let's have a look at this man's amazing events in his life. Really, most people when discussing gunfighting heroes of the Southwest don't know about the courageous and later in life events of this man, at times controversial, El Fago Baca. This includes our Las Cruces public library system where they had nothing on him or could get nothing on him. Then my trip to Barnes and Noble as recently as a couple of weeks ago, and nothing as well. So I do have a collection, my personal, with five different books written about him and numerous other articles. I'll show you the uh, resources at the end in case you want to get them. And maybe the library at DACC will get these books as well. I hope they do. So here we go. He showed courage beyond belief and lived up to his statement that he would show them American cowboys there is one Mexican that was not afraid of him. He proved that in his fight against 80 cowboys. That changed the course of how things were to be done in Frisco and in many other places. The gunfight and extreme display of courage was for good reason and had lasting effects. The subsequent study of his life further begins with his being elected for sheriff in Socorro then admitted to the New Mexico bar as an attorney, superintendent of Socor Socorro schools, the mayor of Socorro, liaison between the Mexican revolutionary president, Huerta, being involved legally and at times illegally with revolutionaries during the years of 1910 to 1920, as you know, were the years of the Mexican revolution. Oh, by the way, part-time as the head bouncer in Juarez at the Tivoli, true story. Um, they wanted uh, him to come to the, the Tivoli part-time in Juarez because there was a gang that was repeatedly going harassing and, and stealing money for them. And we'll get to that in a moment as we go through the slides, but I thought it was so interesting. Here's his badge, El Fago Baca Sheriff, Socorro County. He wore it with pride. He had actually talked from his very young age about justice when he reprimanded the, the uh, lawmen in uh, Frisco, he actually, after you know, admonishing the guy, said, give me a badge, I'll go up there. And he was, and we still don't really know if he was ordained, self-ordained, but we're seeing more and more research that's been done that he was in fact uh, loosely deputized as a deputy, sheriff. Now he's promoted to sheriff, what are his duties? Let's talk about a couple of them. I just bulleted these so we can talk about them. One, there were warrants for people to be arrested. And his deputy went up and said, you know, we have warrants for these people. We better go out and get them. Baca's reply was, no, get me someone in here that I can dictate a letter to. So the letter was stated like this. This is El Fago Baca, sheriff. There's an outstanding warrant for your arrest to be sent to each one of them. And um, if you don't come in within two weeks, I will come and hunt you down. I will assume that you're resisting arrest and I will shoot you. Well, all of the people with warrants, knowing El Fago's background, came in by themselves and with their own volition, except one. Well, El Fago wanted to find out how he could catch him where he was. It was a two days ride. Well, Baca took the two days ride and couldn't find him. So he decided, oh, well, I'll go back, he gets back to the jail in Socorro, and guess what? While he was going one way, the guy came the other way and turned himself in, he didn't want to be shot. Now, another thing that he did, I think that was just, and these are good topics to uh, toss around, closing the jail and freeing Mexican inmates for unreasonable sentences. As he became sheriff and walked in and he saw the jail cells with uh, many of, of the Mexican people that he actually knew, um, being put there for misdemeanor charges, violations of giving an example, one of the people he spoke with 
was there for about two dollars with a 60-day sentence for not being able to pay two bucks. Well, the rest of the stories had their, you know, kind of like similarities in one way or another. So Baca figures, I'm closing a jail and getting these people out of here. Well, administratively, there was a uh, person in corrections that would come around and check on the jails, the inmates, and things like that. As he showed up at Baca, uh, Sheriff Baca's jail, he asked, how are the prisoners? And Baca replied, oh, they're fine. He said, oh, well, let me take a look at them. And Baca said, well, you can't because I freed them. Well, the guy was in half a rage. What do you mean you freeze them? How could you freeze prisoners at a place in jail? Baca's reply was, I don't have the money in my budget to feed them. Plus, they're going to go out and make the money that they need to make and pay the fines they need to pay. That was the end of that. He was actually jailed himself on one occasion. <laughs> Baca actually jailed himself on a trumped up charge on curfew. One of the local judges to bring in some money actually put out an ordinance that people that were out at a certain time and, or in an establishment at a certain time were to be arrested and brought to him before court the next day. And Baca, being as intelligent as he was, figured out how things worked. Here's how it worked. The people that were arrested would appear one before one, one before the other before the judge. And the judge would ask the seminal question, how much money do you have on you? Well, the uh, reply might be a dollar and 40 cents. That's your fine for violating the curfew. Well, Baca knew what he was doing and, and he said to the judge when it was his turn, you know what? Judge had no idea he was the jailer of, uh, for Socorro, as the sheriff. He said, I'm not going to pay the fine. He said, you can put me in jail. The judge said, fine. He sentenced him to 30 days. What that meant to Baca was he'd be working his job as sheriff and in the jail at the time. But also, he was making money because he was given so much per diem for people that were jailed up for food. Now, let's talk about as a bouncer at the Tivoli, his encounter. Why was he hired there? Well, a uh, local gangster by the name of Numero Ocho and his gang would cause many problems at the Tivoli, which was a very famous place in Juarez at the time. It was a casino, it was a saloon, it was a performance theater. It was really the place of places to go. So this Numero Ocho put out the word before Baca got there. I know about this guy's legacy, about what he does. He said, I'll show him who's who when he gets here. I don't think he would ever say a thing like that to, to uh, El Fago Baca, but he did. So what does El Fago do? He goes to the lion's den. He finds out where he can find Numero Ocho with his uh, gang around him. With his Colt 45s at his side, he goes, he finds him in a cellar, right? With uh, his uh, bad guys with him. And he said, which one of you is Numero Ocho? And all fingers and faces appointed to him because they knew he was El Fago Baca and they knew how fast he was with those cold 45s. And uh, with no metal ultra being identified, Baca said, what kind of man has a number for a name, dog? And he walked up and slapped him with his right hand as far as he could. And no metal ultra did nothing but stayed there. And he punched him in the gut. As he bent over and turned around, Baca kicked him so hard he lifted him off the ground. He said, now tell me what you're gonna do. And of course, no matter Ocho, no, the next thing was he was gonna be shot if he did anything. So no more problems at the Tivoli with the good bouncer, El Fago Baca. No money on the side. Now, as an attorney, he gets a call from a client, and by the way, this is not fact, this is contention or legend, but it's cute. He gets a call from a, a client facing a murder charge half a day away. El Fago's reply was, as an attorney, I'll be there with three witnesses. <laughs> so that was that caper. He was legal counselor for the incarcerated Huerta General Salazar. Now, just a real brief history. During the Mexican Revolution, when Porfirio Diaz was overthrown, right, um, Madero steps in. He was there for almost two years or so, I think. And Madero happened to be executed along with his vice president. And of course, 
um, all fingers pointed to Huerta, who was his successor for a very short time as well. Huerta's best general, Salazar, fearless, um, went to U.S. court for trial, violating the neutrality clause, okay? And um, Baca went to represent him. Actually, Baca was licensed to appear before the United States Supreme Court. He was in quite a law firm and, and very brilliant and, and daring man. So in the uh, viola violating the neutrality, he was told by the courts, there's no way that he's going to be released. No matter what you have to say, no matter what appeal you have, he's going to be um, indicted and tried for that crime. So next step, all of a sudden down the road, guess who escapes from jail? Salazar. Well, um, the Mexican revolutionary group of Huerta used a spy team of men and women to eventually find out who's guarding the, the jail, what times, what are the routes, if we needed to go and get General Salazar, get him down to El Paso, send him over to Juarez, and continue fighting for, for Huerta. Well, the whole thing was in place. Now, hours from that jail, but known as part of the route to observe kind of thing, um, with the escape, if there was one to be for Salazar, Alfago Baca happened to walk up to two security officers and say, uh, excuse me, do you know what time it is? And one of the security guards responded, uh, it's 9.30. He said, oh, he said, I have 9.28. And, and you too, do you have the time as well, sir? And the guy replied, 9.30. Well, guess what time the escape took place far, far away, 9.30. Who just developed an, al an alibi? Alfago Baca, okay. So they knew he did it. They couldn't do anything then, but eventually with more investigation, um, he was indicted. But of course, like every and anything he's been to, he's not guilty in the court in Socorro for the two cowboys. He was found not guilty. Oh, by coincidence, um, there always happened to be a total then known as Mexican jury um, with, with people that, that El Fago Baca knew, and they certainly knew about his legend. So during his time with the revolutionary uh, generals, commanders, you know, you had the Villistas, Pancho Villa, you had the Carrancitas, uh, you had the Huertas, you had the Zapatistas. I mean, it was one time of a lot of going on in Mexico with the revolutions. So Pancho Villa, we all know about Pancho Villa. I went to the Cabo Gada some time ago where all these horsemen crossed into the U.S. In, in, in commemoration of the raid on Columbus kind of thing, but very nicely done and well welcome. So he greets Pancho Villa, okay? And uh, after a couple of days spending, he returns to the United States. Well, Pancho Villa realized something. One of his hand-tooled rifles was missing. Who could be the only guy to do that? So he put a $30,000 bounty on Baca's head. Now, later, I'll show you a picture of Baca as an older man holding the rifle. He didn't have to worry about Pancho Villa at that time. We all know the fate of Pancho Villa. So here we go. Part-time in Juarez at the bouncer in Numero Uno and uh, Numero Ocho, I'm sorry, and his gang, now what? Name is, here I am. He tells an envoy sent by Villa, you are a chicken S, you know what? And if I lay eyes on you again, I'll kill you. I think that was pretty bold and daring to say to Pancho Villa too. So how about the case of the $2,000 bail bond defendant appearing, failing to appear? A client approached El Fago complaining he's losing a $2,000 bond that he put up for a defendant that is nowhere to be found. El Fago says, pay me $500 and I'll get you $2,000 back. The client asked, how? El Fago replied, never mind, pay me the 500 and I'll get it. El Fago sought out an older Mexican farmer that spoke no English whatsoever, told him in Spanish, when I wink at you, say guilty. So he made $25 for the day. The farmer was elated. He uh, took him to court and the bond was returned and the new court date was set. The judge reprimanded the farmer because he kept saying, gracias, gracias, gracias. Okay, so to continue. 
Here's a picture of our man El Fevo Baca, which is on the left, and General Salazar. Pretty close, and Salazar eventually made his way back to Juarez, Mexico, and onward from there. Now, from 1913 to 1916, Baca served as an official U.S. rep. He had the opportunity to meet with all many of those revolutionary leaders after, you know, uh, Porfirio Diaz was, you know, assassinated, put out of government, and the succession of generals. In his role, he backed the Huerta presidency. However, we know, like, say, in communist China or Taiwan, we backed the wrong horse. He backed the wrong horse in this instance because Huerta was out of office within a year and a half. So, to continue, this was going on at the same time that many people really don't know about. It was not um, very well known by public, but certainly by officials. So that, let's say, for example, why did they determine with Salazar they're going to prosecute for the neutrality cause? Well, this is an actual occurrence. There was a Zimmerman telegraph from Germany that opened the door for the USA to uncover the Plan de San Diego. In this plan, Germany offered money to some revolutionaries to purchase firearms to cause havoc, keeping the U.S. out of World War I. Because we know it started in 1914, the U.S. didn't enter until 1917. Well, the plan was uncovered by British intelligence from Mexico, some revolutionaries, certainly not all of Mexico by far, to invade the U.S. to recapture the southwestern states, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and California. In part, it would be the killing of all the white males age 16 and over during the insurrection. The plan failed. It never got off the ground. The revolutionaries never attacked the U.S., but entered World War I instead. This further added to higher levels of distrust between Americans and Mexicans, not to mention the little Spanish-American War, less than a year. Remember the cry. Um, remember the main to hell with Spain as they attacked the U.S. ship, supposedly. So, here's our man, Mr. Baca, with Pancho Villa's hand-tooled rifle, proudly displaying it, of course, in his latter years. El Fago kills Celestiano Otero, right there in El Paso, Texas. The escape of Salazar was an extended plot, and it was believed that Celestiano was an agent for another revolutionary reader, leader. He also wanted his money for his involvement in the Salazar caper of escape. He asked El Fago to meet him in private in El Paso, Texas. El Fago told Otero, I'm tired of this, you know what. Well, at their meeting, eventually, Otero drew a pistol and fired at El Fago, grazing Baca's groin, nearly through the pants. Baca responded with quicker than lightning two shots directly into Otero's heart, who died immediately. As usual, El Fago was found not guilty in court, just happened to be a Mexican jury, half of whom were known to El Fago. Also, El Fago was stabbed under his rib cage, also by Baca, not a family Baca member. Okay. And he decided at that point, as he got older, don't go after him, don't kill him, you know. His bid for the Senate seat following our statehood in 1912 as a Republican candidate failed. In his later years, he became a drinker philanderer. Some of his famous quotes, the one I reminded you of, I'll shoot, uh, I'll show those American cowboys. There's one Mexican that's not afraid of them. Also, if you think about, here's what he said, if you think about punching someone in the face if wrong, punch them in the face or be self-conscious for the rest of your life. One time he's driving through the outskirts of Socorro with another official, telling the official in Socorro, driving by a hill, you see that hill over there? I once shot and killed a man there. The official asked, what was the man's name? Baca replied, I wasn't taking a sentence, sentence. I was there to shoot him. Okay, some complained that Ofego felt no compunction shooting and killing a man. To that, his he replied, if a man is out to kill me and I kill him first, oh well, charge for murder, I'll be there within an hour, I'm on the way. Remember that caper with the witnesses. So, here are some of the sources I used um, in researching this for you. 
And uh, if your librarian would like them, I'd, I'd be glad to share them. I think he's making a copy anyway. <clears throat> One was Law and Order Limited, The Life of El, uh, El Fago Baca. Now, the other was The Incredible El Fago Baca, Good Men, Bad Men of the Old West, Howard Bryan. Let's go first to The um, Life of El Fago Baca by Crichton. He was a practicing attorney, while contemporary with El Fago Baca, and has many court documents and uh, experiences and, and good, 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 good resources. <clears throat> the third one I used was The Rousing Life of El Fago Baca, New Mexico. Then El Fago Baca, Destined to Survive by Alvarado. Viva El Fago, the case for El Fago Baca, Hispanic hero. As I was driving through Socorro one day and stopped at that uh, Mexican craft store, while my wife is looking at the crafts, I was looking through the book rack and I found this book and I'm like, oh my goodness, this guy is something else. Why don't we know about him? And I come to find out, it's not only Joe Sweeney that didn't know about him. So there was also westernclippings.com, El Fago Baca, The Frisco Wars, following the El Fago Baca, True West Magazine, uh, a total of 11 of them that I use, okay? So if you ever have the opportunity, visit um, Reserve, or if you're passing through, going to Deming or going up uh, the other way uh, to say Silver City and beyond, <clears throat> stop in Reserve and, and you know stop in and talk to the uh, Martinez uh, survivor, take a look at the monument, the partially constructed uh, Macau. So let's do some epilogue and questions. Thank you for your time. I hope that I've done okay with the presentation. And um, just quickly before questions, maybe as uh, our good librarian um, does that, let me play this for you one more time about a man that made a difference. Why is El Fago Baca not known today? And why do we know about Billy the Kid and you know Clay? Why do we know about Wyatt Earp? Why do we know about Black Jack Ketchum? You could keep going. Why not El Fago Baca? So I've got some answers to that question. No, actually the theories is what they are, certainly on finite answers. Maybe uh, you can share your thoughts as well by way of a cat, uh, question. So one man made a difference. Courageous, much, much courage. Controversial, well, you know, he lived to be 80. Um, he, he did start drinking, he was a philanderer. But I would argue as a licensed um, therapist, in addition to a teaching scholar in history, that, you know what? He was probably suffering from PTSD. Can you imagine yourself in that position? My case is for the bravery and success of El Fago Baca. Okay, Dr. Sweetie. Oh, Hello. Yes. No, see you, Ray. <clears throat> we have some questions and comments, so let me read those to you. Can I play the music once before I take them? <clears throat> okay. Because I noticed there's some people that later joined us. This uh, song, by the way, is from 1960, and I also have a video, believe it or not, that Walt Disney put out Nine Lives of El Fago Baca in 1958. So here we go with a brief music and then questions. Thank you. You can't really hear the music. Joe. <clears throat> Dr. Sweeney, we can't hear the music. Pause. You okay? We can't hear it. Oh, okay. Then we'll have to just go by it. How about some questions? Um, what movie or TV series did you mention? Okay, I'm, I'm going to show this. Um, this is a, um, you can get this actually on Amazon. 
And uh, it's a two part, two uh, American legends. One is El Fago Baca, the other is the Swamp Fox. Now, you can go to Amazon. This is a Walt Disney movie, and I just got it months ago, uh, right from Amazon. You can order it. And what we just discussed, the highlights of, of what went on, um, you'll see them act, enacted each and every one of them. Now, the other thing that Disney didn't push so much, but certainly suggested and, and you figure it out, was the cultural difference. You know, um, El Fago Baca, compared to all those other names that I mentioned at Favorite Heroes, um, was not mentioned so much afterwards. And um, so, yes, this is it. Any other questions? Yeah, uh, was the, <clears throat> excuse me, was the Otero guy related to the Oteros from Otero County? I don't know. I just know that Celestiano Otero, and that would be a good thing for someone watching the uh, program to look up too, is to uh, try to backdate that, try to research it. Go to the county records if you're really interested, and you might do a real nice article, you know, on uh, Celestiano Ortega. Okay? I mean, okay. Uh, I'm sorry, Otero, listen to me. Gee, it's Otero. Yeah. And as far as uh, how he was, how El Fego was able to survive, you asked uh, the participants viewing this to come up with uh, their theories, and one answered that perhaps he stood behind a statue that was unscathed. Good guess, but let's keep going. I hope some, some other theories were postulated, but thank you for that. Okay. Oh, by the um, way, she was unscathed too. She was unscathed, but go ahead. Uh, that's all I've gotten. They're okay. interested in hearing how he survived. Okay. So in this Akal, and the um, current, uh, the location that Akal is where the monument is right now, unbeknownst to the cowboys, the floor in the Akal was 18 inches below the doorway where El Fago just slipped into the, so to speak, box hole, and the bullets rang right over his head. And somehow, miraculously, La Nuestra Señora de Santa Ana was unscathed as well. Ah, very good. <clears throat> Other questions? I think that's it for now. Anyone else have any further comments or questions for Dr. Sweeney? So, you know, uh, in concluding and saying thank you all very much for attending, um, my case for Alfredo Baca is he, he, made a, he made a change. Things in Frisco, current reserve New Mexico, um, you know, started to change following that because, you know, the residents figured, hey, we don't need to take this kind of treatment. And then the Cowboys felt that too. So, you know, through struggles all the time, over time, it was actually an, an extremely positive influence that he left us with. Now, you know, towards the end of his life with some of the, um, I would suggest, uh, post-traumatic stress that he experienced um, is perhaps self-medicating or, you know, trying to get away from the thoughts in, a, in another way sort of thing. But why is it that he's not so well known as the other gunfighters? Um, I don't know. I, let me say this real quick. Why do we celebrate Cinco de Mayo as a Mexican holiday versus Dies y Seis de Septiembre? Well, one is of major significance because they won the war. And of course, Cinco de Mayo is a battle of Puebla, a batalla de Puebla. Um, we Big need marketing. to make this area more well known, especially where, you know, where we live in this area, um, in Las Cruces, other parts of New Mexico, El Paso, Texas, um, more aware of these events. So I hope that perhaps your library, I don't know if you can order those books, um, will go ahead and, and, you know, order these materials or teachers teaching New Mexico history courses, I've taught it at graduate and undergraduate level, um, will make people more aware so they can spread the good word. How's that? Uh, great way to end. Thank you very much, Dr. Sweeney.
We appreciate everyone joining us. Our next program will be at four o'clock about uh, Las Cruces sister cities and their sister city in Ciudad Lerdo, Durango, Mexico. Please join us. Peace. Thank you all. Good afternoon. Okay. All right, so how do we close out?